this is the message we have heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Please turn with me in your program to your study guide, and let me welcome those of you that are joining us online. We're so glad. Had almost 1,000 last Sunday that joined us online. Also uh, so uh, blessed to have our friends with us from First Baptist Church in Arco, Idaho, and also our friends at Purpose Church in Kalispell, Montana. We are so glad that you're joining us today for our study of God's Word. We're continuing our series, In the Light, uh, the letters of John, that John, the apostle of John, the disciple of Jesus, the apostle of Jesus, who followed after Jesus, and he wrote a biography of John called the Gospel of John, and then he wrote these three letters to the churches uh, to teach them about the Christian life. Now, we have a philosophy here at Purpose Church uh, of, of alternating or balancing topical studies from the Bible, where you take a topic or a subject, and you go through the whole Bible and see what it says about that topic, and verse-by-verse verse study, where you take a section of the Bible, usually a book of the Bible, and you go verse-by-verse verse through it. And some churches only believe in topical. That's all they do is topical. And some churches only believe in verse-by-verse. Verse. That's all they do. But we believe here at Purpose Church that both are good. And so we try to balance the two uh, throughout the year. So, for example, sometimes we'll take a topic like we did this fall of work or, or heaven or relationships, and we'll look throughout the Bible to see what it says about that subject or that topic. Or sometimes uh, we'll take a book like Philippians or Judges like we did in the fall, and we'll go chapter by chapter through it, or in the case of Philippians, verse by verse uh, through it. But the series now that we're on, on the letters of John, has been kind of a combination of the two. It's kind of been a combination topical and uh, verse by verse. Pastor Eric and Pastor Lisa were very disciplined. Pastor Eric took chapter one that I assigned him, and he stayed in chapter one. And Pastor Lisa uh, last Sunday took chapter four, and she was very disciplined to stay in chapter four. But in the three times I've preached now on 1 John, I've been all over the place. And basically what I'm doing is it's more topical within the letter of 1 John. And so I've been looking at the themes, the major themes in John that we find throughout the book. And so three weeks ago I talked about how to be assured of your salvation. A couple of Sundays ago I talked about how to have a genuine experience with God. And today we're going to talk about who do you love the most. Uh, next Sunday, I'll be more disciplined going verse by verse through 2 John, and then Chris Brown's here, and then I'll go verse by verse uh, through 3 John. But today, I just want to look at that, that question, who do you love the most? Uh, John starts out in 1 John 2, verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. And so he says, do not love the the world. Now, the, the Greek word here that's translated world is cosmos, and it's used 185 times in the New Testament. And most of the times, a majority of the times, it's used by John. Just in the Gospel of John and the three letters of John, over half the time, that means about 100 times, this is one of John's favorite words, just in four books, he uses it uh, over 100 times. And so what does it mean? What does he mean by the world? The meaning of cosmos in the Bible completely depends on the, on the context. It can mean different things based on the context. Uh, sometimes it refers to the natural world, uh, the earth, uh, where we live. And when it's used that way, it's used uh, neutrally. Uh, sometimes it refers to the people of the world. Whenever it's used that way, it's used positively. Sometimes it refers to the unbelieving world. That is, those that are opposed to God and under the influence of Satan. It also refers to worldly values that are opposed to God. And when it's used that way, it's used negatively. Now, first of all, here in, in this verse, uh, what does it not mean when John says, don't love the world? First of all, what doesn't it mean? First of all, it doesn't mean God's creation. 
We as followers of Christ are supposed to uh, believe in, in environmental protection. And we're supposed to be concerned about earth care. Uh, we're supposed, it doesn't mean God's creation. We're to love nature and beauty and food and comfort and the good things of life. Uh, we as followers of Christ are supposed to take care of the earth and enjoy the good things that God has provided. Uh, the Pharisees called Jesus a glutton. They called him a glutton and a drunkard, and that's just because he enjoyed a good meal. Jesus loved a good meal, and so the Pharisees called him a glutton and a drunkard. That means that you can glorify God by when you enjoy great music and when you eat at Chick-fil-A, you are worshiping God. Uh, you worship him six days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You can worship him by eating Chick-fil-A, but they're closed on Sunday. And that's why we have services here at church on Sunday. Because you can't worship at Chick-fil-A, so you got to have some place to worship. And so that's why we have church here on Sunday. No Chick-fil-A uh, on Sunday. Second thing that John doesn't mean here. It doesn't mean that you hate the economic and social structures of society. It doesn't mean that a Christian is supposed to hate all government or big business or the music industry or, or Hollywood just as a matter of principle. Uh, some Christians say that you should avoid uh, secular professions like politics or journalism. And that's absolutely untrue. If we abandon those things, we abandon them to non-Christ followers. We need more Christians in politics. Anybody want to say amen to that? We need more Christians in journalism. We need more Christians in Hollywood. More Christians in the music industry. Third thing it doesn't mean, uh, when John says to not love the world, it doesn't mean that we hate culture. Uh, growing up in southern Virginia, we had a little saying, don't drink, dance, or chew, or go out with girls who do. That was, uh, that was our rule back then. Don't drink, dance, or chew, or go out with girls who do. Uh, there were certain music styles, that just the style, not the lyrics were considered under Satan, but just the music style itself were considered of the devil. Uh, the evangelist that I was saved under, his name was Jack Van Impey. And he's still around. I think he's in his 90s and still on TV. And uh, man, he, he, he was an amazing person. He had memorized, he had a photographic memory. He had memorized the entire Bible from cover to cover. He was an expert on Bible prophecy. And here's the best part for somebody growing up in Southern Virginia in the 1960s, all right? Uh, in 1950s, 1960s. He was the top accordion player in the world. Oh my goodness, you're in Southern Virginia, that's a draw, all right? You know, you just say, hey, come to my church. They've got the top accordion player in all, in all the world. And so I got saved under him. Actually, after one of his services, I told my dad I wanted to receive Christ and knelt down next to my dad's bed in our, our, his bedroom and received Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was seven years old. Uh, so I don't remember, but I don't remember a word he preached about uh, during that entire week, I came to Christ under his preaching, or at least my dad led me to Christ after one of his sermons, uh, led me to Christ, uh, but I, I came to Christ under him, but I only remember one thing as a seven-year-old, one thing from a whole week of preaching, and that was when he preached against rock and roll music. And I remember him telling us this, and man, as a seven-year-old, I'm just hanging on every word. He said that when you listen to rock and roll music, your head would go back and forth like that. And it would release toxins from your spinal cord that would seep into your brain and cause you to go insane. And so as a seven-year-old, I did not want to go insane. And so I, I, I remember that. Uh, I remember an illustration we used to hear that when you play rock music next to a flower, the flower would grow in the other direction uh, away, away from it. And so these are the kind of things we learned about that style of music when I was growing up in Virginia. Uh, by the way, David Hans came in this morning and had to rub it in. What a mess Virginia is in today. And, uh, and David Hans told me, he says, West Virginia is so embarrassed by Virginia that they're changing their name to East Kentucky instead of, uh, uh, instead of um, West Virginia. Thanks, Dave. Really, really do appreciate that. You know, so. um, Christians back then were supposed to look different as well. Uh, guys had to wear ties, have short hair. No beards and never get tattooed or pierced. Uh, we even had a song back then that went like this. If your hair is too long, there's sin in your heart. If your hair is too long, there's sin in your heart. And believe it or not, there was potential for my hair to be long back then. I know you don't think that, but it, we, we used to have a joke back then about a guy says to his dad, Hey, Dad, I want a car. I want to borrow your car. And, and the dad says, Well, you can if you cut your hair. 
And the son said, well, you know, Dad, Jesus went around with long hair. And the father said, yeah, but the Bible also said Jesus walked wherever he went. And so uh, I remember uh, a, fr- a friend of mine, a um, friend of mine, he, he was a real hippie back then, and, uh, and he came to Christ, radically saved. And first church he went to was a church in Chicago area, big church. And he said the pastor, right, he had a beard, he had a full beard, and right in the middle of his sermon, the pastor pointed him out during the message and said, young man, shave that sin off of your face. Shave that sin off your face. Uh, back then, girls had to wear denim jumpers and culottes. How many of you remember culottes? Did anybody here? Okay, we got a few. We had a lot in the 830 service. They, they knew, knew culottes. Let's see how it goes in 1111. I'm not sure I'll have anybody know that. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe the pendulum today has kind of gone too far the other way. Uh, Christians don't have to look different just for different sake. We don't have to say that fashion is, is wrong just because it's popular at that time. But it is a biblical value to dress modestly. And so in that way, we should dress differently than the world. Not different fashion for fashion's sake, but when fashion violates biblical modesty, uh, then that is a way that Christians should dress differently. Now, number four, it doesn't mean that we should hate the people of the world, obviously. John three sixteen and 17, for God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the cosmos to condemn the cosmos, but to save the cosmos through him. So if it doesn't mean all those things, what does John mean when he says, don't love the world, don't love the cosmos? When John says, do not love the world, he means the world as it is arrayed in rebellion against God. That's what he means here. The cosmos, do not love the cosmos when the cosmos is arrayed in rebellion against God. C.J. Mahaney gives this definition of the world. It says, the world is the organized system of human civilization that is actively hostile to God and alienated from God. Actively hostile to God, actively alienated from God. Let me tell you an example, I I think is an example of this, of what John is talking about. Happened a couple of weeks ago in Albany, New York, about 150 miles from where Kimberly and I pastored uh, for 12 years when the New York State Legislature uh, affirmed late-term abortion, that is, right up to the point of birth, you could could abort and and take the life of a seven-pound baby as long as it hadn't been born yet, and partial birth abortion, where it was in the midst of, of, of being born. You could take its life then. Then the governor of Virginia, before all the other mess that's been happening in Virginia, before that happened, he came out uh, saying that you could even let the baby die after birth. That if the baby were born and, and the mother and the doctor decided that that baby shouldn't live, that the baby wouldn't live. You know, basically, that viewpoint that's becoming more and more prevalent in America today is, is basically what the Romans believed at the time that John wrote this letter. It was called the Roman concept of pater familias, where a child was never truly allowed to live until even after it was born, it wasn't allowed to live unless the father received it into the household. And so if that child was born and, and had a deformity or a disability, uh, or if it was a girl, okay, they would say, it was a, oh, it's, a, it's a baby girl, and turn to the father, and if the father stood like this, they'd take the baby and dump it outside the dump outside the city. And the early Christ followers were known. This is one of the first things we were known as as followers of Jesus. Christ followers were the ones that would rescue those babies from the dumps that had been abandoned outside the city, would save their lives, would adopt them, and raise them as a member of their family. That's one of the first things we were known for. Uh, and, And so if the father opened his arms and received the child, it was allowed to live. If he did not receive it, it was not uh, allowed to live. But you know, it wasn't even so much that decision, that legislation, which I do believe was completely and utterly wrong. But beyond that, it was the attitude in which it was done. Uh, it was done to a standing ovation, to smiles and cheers 
and, and, and to celebrate the event, Governor Andrew Cuomo lit up major buildings all across the state of New York. And here's the great irony. One of the buildings he had lit up in celebration of this legislation was the One World Trade Center, which the One World Trade Center includes a memorial to the 11 unborn children that were killed in the 9-11 attacks. The irony that that building was lit up in celebration of this when at the base of that building is a memorial to the 11 unborn children that also died during the 9-11 attacks. Now, it's easy to point fingers at somebody far away. Uh, how does this apply to us in our lives? Let's, let's bring it home to us. Bring it home to me. 1 John 2, verse 16, he goes on to describe what he's talking about here. For don't love the world. For everything in the world, three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now this word, word lust here is a translation from the Greek word epithumia. And J.D. Greer gives this definition of epithumia, a desire that has taken on too much weight. Now, what that means is importance, not literal weight. Kimberly and I were laughing about this last night and saying that looked like, oh, that's what we've got, epithumia. That, that's the problem. Sounds like a disease. I don't have any control over it. I just caught myself some epithumia, which is a desire <laughs> that has taken on too much weight. All right, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about any desire that takes on too much importance in our lives, a craving that has taken on such weight or importance in your life that it controls, that it controls you. And so he talks about three things. First of all, uh, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, uh, that's when some good thing God created becomes so important to you that you feel that you couldn't be happy without it. Or it takes on such an important role in your life that you're willing to disobey God's laws in order to get that thing. A great example of this is sex. I mean, sex is a wonderful thing. It's a gift from God. God invented it. God made it. It's a good thing. But when you treat it like the ultimate thing, like the main thing, that's when John says that good thing has become worldly. That's when it's worldly, when a good thing is treated like an ultimate thing. I think you'd agree that we, as a culture, have a cultural obsession with sex. Our culture has made it the ultimate thing. If you don't experience that, your life is worth nothing. How could anybody live without this? This good thing has now become an ultimate thing. Now, I get my cultural awareness training by standing in the grocery line. That's where I do my research for cultural awareness. So I'm always like studying the fronts of all the magazines and I find out what's happening with, with um, British royalty and, uh, and, and many of the, the titles of the articles in, in almost all the magazines are things like 10 ways to drive your man wild. Uh, or even in magazines that have nothing to do with sex like Field and Stream. I mean, even in Field and Stream, they have titles like how to get your girl in the duck blind, or, or you know, something like that. So I read that because as a Virginian, I wanted to get Kimberly in the duck blind, I'm telling you, right there. And, and, and so, so the lust of the flesh is when we make a good thing, we make it into an ultimate or an all-important thing. Second thing that John talks about is he calls it the lust, uh, the lust of the eyes. That's when you see something good that becomes so important, you can't be happy without it. Like money, for example. You get jealous of somebody that has more of it than us. Or we make unwise decisions uh, to get it. Uh, we go into debt to get an object. Or we overwork to get more money. Uh, Solomon warned us in Proverbs 23, verse 4. He says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. It, it's a good thing. Money's a good thing. It's just not the ultimate thing. Just don't wear yourself out or destroy your family life or your relationships uh, getting more of it. Or maybe we don't tithe and give generously um, because of this. If, if you're in a place where you can't afford to be generous, you got to ask yourself the question, have I given into the lust of the eyes? Or sometimes people save so much, which seems like a really good thing to be a saver, but you save so much that you can't be generous and give 10% away uh, to the work of God. Then the third thing John talks about here is the pride of of life. And that's when our wealth or our accomplishments in life 
uh, become something that we take pride in or we boast in. Now, there's a couple of ways that we do this. First of all, when we think that because of what we've accomplished in life, we are better than other people. We want other people to notice how special we are. We're better than everybody because of what we've accomplished. Or uh, secondly, uh, these things in our life that we've accomplished uh, or the money we've earned, it makes us feel stable so we don't have anything to worry about for the future. Uh, and maybe our money or our 401k or um, you say, you know what, people like me and so even if I lose it all, I I've got a winsome personality and I'll make it, I'll land on my feet or, or I'm so talented that I'm gonna be okay and my trust is in that. And so the pride of life is where we have confidence in our future that is, is based on me rather than based on our faith in God. So let me ask you a question. What makes you feel confident about the future? When you think about the future, what makes you feel confident about the future? Is it something or someone or is it yourself or is your confidence in God and God alone? First uh, John 5, verse 21, the last verse of the letter of First John. So he kind of summarizes the whole letter, the whole five chapters in this one last verse. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So conversion is when you stop putting ultimate weight or importance on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and you put it on God instead. That's what conversion is. It's where you say, God, I'm gonna keep myself from the idols in life. They're good things. Did you know that many of these idols, all the things I've been talking about, money and jobs and, and reputation and, and 401ks and, and all that stuff, that's all good. Accomplishments, that's all good. But when we make them the ultimate thing, it becomes an idol. And so conversion is when you stop putting ultimate weight on those idols, and instead you put it on God as the number one source of your confidence. Repentance is beginning to worship God as God again. Have you done that this morning? Have you at a point where you repented of the idols in your life and say, God, I turn from those idols, I turn 180 degrees, and now I'm gonna put my confidence in you. You are gonna be the source of my confidence, not those idols. J.D. Greer gives the definition of idolatry. He says, when you love something more than God, depend on something more than God, obey something more than God, it's when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing. Idolatry is when a good thing becomes a God, capital G, thing and turns into a bad thing. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask myself the question. What do you love the most in life? Glenn, I'll ask myself the question. Glenn, what do you love the most in life. Now there's nothing wrong with loving things, but do they dominate your emotions? What do you fantasize uh, about having? And I've had a few days this week to kind of ask myself this question. So now as my church family, I'm asking you the question, what do you fantasize about having? Uh, what are you terrified of losing? What's the one thing in your life that you said, without that thing, life would not be worth living? Uh, maybe it's money. Maybe it's being married. Maybe you're not married. And you think, man, the one thing that would just be totally disaster I couldn't live without is if I never got married. Or having kids. The one thing I, I, I couldn't live without if I, if I never had kids. Or, or maybe it's a certain hobby. If I couldn't do that thing or have that hobby, that's the one thing that I would say life would not be worth living. Uh, what commands your obedience? What are you most faithful to obey? Uh, maybe it's your desires. What temptations are you just unable, unwilling to say no to because it just means too much to you? Maybe you're enslaved uh, to success. Uh, I know some people who are so enslaved to others' opinions that they live every second of every day worrying about how to please other people. And they're willing to do anything to gain that affirmation. The technical term for that condition, uh, they're called high school students. That's, that's the technical term for it. Now you high schoolers, I'm not picking on you. I'm not picking on you. Uh, I, I was there once myself. You're like, Pastor Glenn, you were in high school? Uh, that must have been in the 1800s or something like that. Yes, I went to high school with Abraham Lincoln. You know, you can see it in a, in a yearbook there. Um, you know, we, we've all been there. And to be very frank, 
we, we are still there to a large degree. We didn't just leave all that in high school or in junior high. We still struggle with that uh, as well. With the, with the danger of idols, which are good things that have become ultimate or all-important things within our lives. Three things. Idolatrous love of the world shows that God is missing from your life. Uh, You were made to worship. You were created to worship something. And if God's not in our life, at the center of it all, as we were just singing the praise song, what an appropriate praise song, Jesus is the center of it all. If, If we don't have Jesus there, we crave other things to fill that hole. Um, We put other stuff there, like the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But those things never quite satisfy you. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, It's like being on a raft in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you're dying of thirst, and all around you is beautiful water. And you think to yourself, it looks like it, it would satisfy you, but it's salt water. And so the more you drink, the thirstier you become. The more we try to fill it with other things, the hungrier or the thirstier uh, we become. Here's a quote by Madonna from Vogue magazine, and if you're too young to know who Madonna was, uh, she's the Beyonce of my generation, all right? And by the way, poor uh, Pastor Peter uh, Wilson, our media pastor, uh, he had to sin in order to find an appropriate picture to show here on Sunday morning. I said, Pete, I don't want to search for it. i got to preach on Sunday, all right? So it is the only one he found that you could show on Sunday morning. Uh, She writes, my drive in life comes from a fear of being mediocre. That is always pushing me. I push past one smell of it and discover myself as a special human being, but then I feel I'm still mediocre and uninteresting unless I do something else. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended, and I guess it never will. Oprah Winfrey's probably the hardest working woman in America, and she once described why she works so hard. She said, I discovered I didn't feel worth anything and certainly not worthy of love unless I was accomplishing something. Augustine, who was a pastor in 400 AD, 1600 years ago, he said, our hearts are restless, O God, until they find their rest in thee. Our hearts are restless, O God, until they find their rest in thee. Could it be that all of my stress and all of my straining and all of my dissatisfaction and all of my worry and my envy and jealousy is pointing to the fact that I've never repented of my idolatry and come home to the love of God. Second thing, the way to overcome the world is by embracing the love of the Father. Now this is really important. This is maybe the most helpful thing this morning. At least it's been the most helpful in my life. You know, we spend our lives beating ourselves up like, no, 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 don't have the don't have the lust of the eyes. Don't have the lust of, of the flesh. No, no, no. Stop having the pride of life. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Where the answer, John says, is to grow in our love of the Father. And if we grow in the love of the Father, it will naturally push those things aside. For example, for the next three seconds, nobody in this room, nobody watching online or in Kalispell or in Arco, nobody, Think about pink elephants for three seconds, okay? No, no pink, stop it. No pink elephants, no pink elephants, all right? Now, what are we all thinking about, including myself? I'm thinking about a pink elephant. Now, let's do something else for another three seconds. On the count of three, for three seconds, everybody here, everybody watching Arco and Kalispell and online, everybody think about a purple elephant right now. Everybody just think about a purple elephant. One, two, three, purple elephant, purple elephant, purple elephant. Okay, what are we thinking about? A purple elephant. What are we not thinking about? A pink elephant. This is brilliant stuff. I hope you appreciate, you know, I had to go to seminary for three years, had to be a Bible major in college for four years. It took seven years to come up with things like that. I, you know, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, aren't you glad you came in the rain to church this morning? But, but, it, but it really is, it works to, to drive out the other. When we increase our love of the Father, we fall less in love with these other things. 1 John 5, verse 4, John says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. 
Now, 1 John 5, 20, this is interesting. This is the one right before. This is the next to the last verse in the letter of 1 John. And it's right before the last verse, which says, don't run after idols. Okay, So just before he says, don't run after idols, here's what he says. We also know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. By being in his Son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. He says, when you consume yourself with the worship of the true, it will drive out the false. The idols that are false will fall away the more we unfold. The, the Puritans get a bad rap as being just kind of sour, nasty people. Nobody want to have a next door neighbor that was a Puritan. That is a bad rap. That is not true. They were, for the most part, passionate lovers of Jesus Christ. They, they, their hobby, their vocation, everything in their life was about how to fall more deeply and passionately in love with God. And so they had, they had this thing the Puritans did called the expulsive power of a new affection. That is, the more you fall in love with God, the power of a new affection has an expulsive power. It, it expulses, it pushes out other things that are lesser when you fall more in love with him with a new affection. The way we overcome smaller cravings is by replacing them with a larger one. It's not that my attraction to sin is too strong, it's that my love for God is too weak. It's not that my attraction to sin is, so, is too strong, it's that my love for God is too weak. And then number three, and oh, this is a good one for us. This is, this is so important. Only by not lusting for the world can you ever love the world. Only by not lusting for the world, the bad world that John's talking about, can you ever love the world, the people of the world that Jesus died for. We, we have a purpose statement, a mission statement here, Purpose Church. Everyone everywhere following Jesus. How do we accomplish that? How do we fulfill that? We're part of the greatest movement in world history, the biggest, most pervasive, fastest growing. We get to be a part of this thing. One out of three people on planet Earth is, are in some way a follower of Jesus Christ, and we got to reach the other two-thirds. How do we do that? The only way we, we can, the only way we can give away the things of the world to reach the world for Jesus is when we don't depend on the things of the world for our happiness. The only way we can, I mean, so many times we say, okay, we don't have the time or the energy or the resources to pull off everyone everywhere following Jesus. But you see, the only way we can give away time and give away energy and give away resources to reach the world for Jesus is when we don't depend on that time, energy, and resources for our happiness. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. My prayer for Purpose Church, and I'm gonna read this because I wanna get it straight. My prayer for Purpose Church is that we would not, we would so not love the world. We would so not love the world that we can so love the world. My prayer for Purpose Church is that we would so not love the world so that we can so love the world. That we would be able to give up our most precious things in the world to see the people of the world join us in heaven someday. Uh, the only way we can let it go, the stuff of this world, is by finding something better than the world has to give, which is the love of the Father. By realizing that everything you got to give up in the world to follow Jesus you'll gain for eternity anything you give up to fulfill everyone everywhere following Jesus. Everything we give up in this life to take our family and friends with us to heaven, we will get a million times that ourselves when we get to heaven. 1 John 2, 17, he said, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God is gonna live forever. Whatever idol we give our life for, we're going to lose in the end. That kingdom on earth that we build up is going to crumble someday. That money we accumulate is going to fritter away. That reputation we build is going to fade in memory from people on the earth. But whatever we do for Christ is going to last forever. My life verse ever since I was in high school is Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom 
and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him first. Love him first. And you'll get blessings here in this life that are going to last into eternity forever. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As the praise band comes back up for our closing uh, worship, um, I just want to close with this. Uh, Today, the continent of Africa probably has more vibrant Christ followers than any place on earth. Africa is just where the church is just exploding. It's vibrant. It's growing. And the man that may be the most responsible for that happening was named David Livingston. Uh, He devoted his life to, to three things. He had three great passions in life. One was exploring Africa. He's considered one of the greatest explorers that ever lived, one of the greatest explorers of all time. He loved Africa, and so he devoted his life to exploring Africa. His second great passion in life was fighting the slave trade in Africa. That was his second great great passion. He was kind of um, uh, the Tomiko Chacon of the 1800s. And then his third great passion in life was reaching Africa for Christ, exploring Africa, fighting the slave trade in Africa, and reaching Africa for Christ. And and he made tremendous, horrendous sacrifices uh, to achieve those three passions in his life. But towards the end of his life, this is what he wrote. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward and healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. Is it, it is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege, anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Let's stand and let's worship for a few more minutes.